the bridge was wide enough for three men shoulder to shoulder. So here I am shoulder to shoulder. Here's the second man shoulder to shoulder. Here's the third man shoulder to shoulder. So the original bridge was narrower than this bridge that you're on right now. So essentially what that means is that a horse, people, and carts could come back and forth. But if it was a stagecoach or like a kind of stago wagon, something like that, you use the Ford because this is where it was shallow enough to do that. And the Ford was up kind of where you see that tree line out there. That's where the Ford was to get across. So do you see that the British came across here on the bridge because the Americans failed to burn it, but even if they did, they could have forded the river a little bit further up. If you look right over here, this is a sewage treatment center. That's approximately where the original port was located. So that meant that sailing ships in the 1700s could come all the way up here, dock, load tobacco, and go back down into the Potomac and eventually out into the Chesapeake Bay, out into the Atlantic. You couldn't do that today. If we were here at low tide, you would see mud flats all out in through here. If you want to try to canoe or paddle this area in a kayak, you got to do it on high tide. You can't even get up here. That's how it's changed that much from what it used to be like to what it looks like today. So <clears throat> that's the town of Bladensburg. We came down Lowndes Hill. The British came right down that same hill. As they were coming down that hill, they could look across and they could see the American positions. And here's what they saw. They saw the first American line right here, approximately where you see that building over there, kind of that tan looking building. That's where the American first line would have been. And there was a battery there with six cannon. They controlled the bridge. The second American line, you really can't see it from here, but it's where the dueling grounds were located. The dueling grounds are so far behind the first line that they gave no support to the first line. So when the British saw that, they said, this is, this is not a battle. This is going to be three little skirmishes. We're going to do the first line. We're going to do the second line. And by the time they were finished, there was actually a third line that formed. And that was up on the DC line. When Aaron was talking, he mentioned about Fort Lincoln Cemetery. Fort Lincoln is a Civil War fort. It has nothing to do with World 1812. But that's, there's Aaron right there. There he is. But that's where the American Third Line was. And so the significance of, I just wish we had more time to do it, is that the first line eventually retreats into the second line and causes the second line to panic into the third line. Where do you think Winder was? This is the man who's in command. Line. You would line. think he would be right up at the first line. No. He's no, at the second officer. line. And he even in his report, he states that he did not even realize what was going on at the first line until he saw the men retreating through the orchard. He could not even see the first line. <laughs> so here's your command. Did he tell and instruct his troops that if they were to fall back, where they should fall back to? No. Well, there's two roads. When you get across this bridge, back in 1814, there were two roads. There was the Bladensburg Road that eventually goes into Washington, D.C., and then there's a, another road that went off to the right that went to Georgetown. The American troops on the first line, almost all of them, retreated on the Georgetown line, which meant that they were actually retreating beyond and outside of where most of the Americans were in the second line. So they weren't even, even the ones that retreated back weren't really even in support of the second line. You would think the first line would, re would retreat back to help support the second line. They were actually retreating away from the second line. And then the third line was primarily formed by Joshua Barney. Remember we talked about him at St. Leonard's Creek. Well, what happens is that when he destroys the flotilla under the orders of the Secretary of Navy, he is ordered to take his men and join the American troops that are near the Woodyard, which was the American uh, encampment in Prince George's County. And from that point, they continued to withdraw until they got all the way back to the Navy Yard. There were three bridges that went across the river. You got this bridge, you got another bridge down essentially where the um, old John F. Kennedy Stadium area is, for those that are familiar with this area. <coughs> and then you've got the, the bridge potentially where Pennsylvania Avenue goes across. And Joshua Barney and his men, the flotilla men, were ordered to hold that lower bridge. And when you go from Maryland into Anacostia, heading across that bridge into the inner city area, you end up at what's known as Barney Circle. 
It's named after Joshua Vine. There's no tribute to him at all there, but Aaron, you're going to take care of that. We're going to give him the best shot. All right, that's good. That's what I want to hear. Because he deserves to have some credit. And he has to plead with his superiors to be able to leave that position because he knows that the British are coming here. They're not coming down to that bridge. So he eventually gets permission. He arrives on the scene of the battle after the battle had already started. So here you have about 400, maybe 450 flotilla men, and you also have about 114 Marines. And protecting their left flank and their right flank are militia. So what does the British do? After they've conquered the first line, they conquer the second line, they do a head-on attack into the third line, Barney opens up his cannon and decimates the British that are attacking. The British aren't stupid, they withdraw. They do a flanking maneuver. Who are they flanking against? Militia. What do the militia do? They run like hell. <laughs> and so now Barney is outflanked. What does he do? He orders his men to charge. Now keep in mind, we're talking about sailors. These are guys who are taught to fight on board ships. What are they doing? They're out here on land, in a land engagement. So they're attacking, they're running down the hill, attacking the British, and what are they hollering out? If you can believe the stories in the books, I've never seen a primary document that says it. They're hollering out, boredom, boredom, <laughs> which is what you would say when you want to attack another <laughs> ship. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I guess they would talk about. Yeah. Is that right? You're a Navy guy. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it's true or not, I have no idea. But to make a long story short, the guy who's in charge of the Marines, his name is Samuel Miller, he is wounded and he is captured in that charge. Eventually, the British attack again because they've outflanked the Americans. Barney realizes that he's almost surrounded. He orders all of his men to withdraw. He stays behind because he's so badly wounded that he's, he's beginning to faint whatnot. He's losing a lot of blood. He is then overtaken by the, the British troops. He asks for an officer. The officer realizes who he is. They bring up Coburn and Ross. Ross, completely identified with this guy, realizes that he's the man that really showed most of the bravery he and his men in this entire battle. So he is pardoned on the spot. And we talked about the agreements as to what that pardon was all about. So essentially, that's what happened.